Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to presume that you can hear me very well. Um, if you can't, uh, let me introduce you to Slido, uh, which if you use the, if you download that and use the hashtag regional horizons P1, you will be able to ask questions uh, at the appropriate time. But if you, um, <laughs> you can't hear me, you won't be doing that. Um, my name's Corey Watts. I'm um, acting policy director for Farmers for Climate Action. And I'm really pleased that uh, so many people, well over a hundred of you, uh, could make it today. It's um, extraordinary and thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we know how tough it is these days um, with so many uh, meetings on the web. Uh, we're, really, we're really pleased that you could do that and, and, and welcome to you. And, um, and with that, let me also uh, acknowledge that we are gathered today uh, on the lands of many people, uh, the First Nations people, the traditional owners of this country. And um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, so yes, hopefully Slido is working for you. And after each talk, there'll be about five minutes to, um, to have a chat. Uh, and we won't be able to, we may not be able to attend to every question, but we'll, we'll do our best to get a good even spread. Uh, please make sure that you turn your video off unless you're speaking, uh, because if you don't, we'll do it for you. Um, and because I've only got a short period of time, let me just get straight to it. Uh, and um, the people you really wanna hear from, uh, let me introduce Lucinda Corrigan, uh, head honcho of, of Farmers for Climate Action and uh, an old and dear friend of mine. Um, and also a beef producer uh, and also runs a, a beef genetics operation as well. And Lucinda has been involved uh, in many different uh, ventures connecting science to, to farmers for best practice and to, to, make, um, to make a better go of it in, in a country that's got a, a bit of an uncertain future, uh, trying to give people some hope with knowledge. Um, so let me introduce Lucinda and over to you, Lucinda. Thanks, Corey, and welcome to everybody who's made the time to uh, attend this morning. I particularly like to welcome Professor uh, Leslie Hughes and Russell Mamet um, from the Insurance Council. Um, and Leslie is a very esteemed academic in, um, in, in climate science and uh, um, a member of also, not only from Macquarie University, but also a member of the Climate Council. I was thinking, um, when I read her bio, I thought about um, her lifetime award last year from the Australian Museum and her, um, her six pointers for hope. And one of them was uh, young people. And I, I guess that's why we're doing this work because we really want to see um, a generational future for agriculture and food production and regional Australia. So I thought um, the, the regional horizons uh, policy paper has four key areas and uh, I, so we'll discuss I guess the risk management uh, side of that today through the work through the work that we want to do with the with um, thinking about how insurance companies are assessing the risk when we look at the previous summer and we look at the cost of the bushfires which um, on some in some places have been estimated at over a hundred billion dollars and I guess some of the the less easily to quantify uh, costs of the bushfires, including uh, the losses of biodiversity, are uh, something that perhaps we, we haven't totally estimated yet. And now we have the cost of the pandemic, and um, it's hard to know what that's going to end up being. But I think regional and rural Australia has come pretty well out of this, this time, um, because with our low population density, and most of the nice places to visit now that you can't go overseas, uh, people are really thinking again, I think about the regions and whether they can um, interact with regional Australia in a different way. There's no doubt that diversified economies are stronger in regional Australia. And when we look at um, places in Australia, which perhaps have um, small numbers of commodities they rely on less versus the more diversified economies, we can see the ones that have a greater resilience, certainly an economic resilience. Fiona Simpson launched the National Farmers Federation, um, you know, post pandemic, uh, strategy this week at the Australian, at the Rural Press Club. And she said, when ag does well, Australia does well. I think I'd like to take it further than that and say, when the regions do well, Australia does well, because that's what we 
want to see. We want to see strong regions. We've diversified, um, you know, workplaces and, and um, um, economies that people thrive in. This is a really well thought out and researched plan. Um, our previous uh, head of collaborations and partnerships, Verity Morgan Schmidt, worked with many bodies to, to look at the, um, the, the four elements of the plan, the Climate Smart Agriculture, the Land and Environment Investment Fund, the importance of leadership, and um, obviously the, the, the investment required in renewables and energy in, for the regions. I think when I look at our own fam family farming family farming business. I really, uh, I think that uh, Climate Smart Ag is just essential for us. We're currently um, in a pilot with Meat and Livestock Australia, looking at our carbon um, footprint and how we will mitigate and um, um, reduce those emissions and, and become carbon neutral by 2030. And I'm very optimistic that we will get there, looking at um, some of the things we've been able to do. So I'd really like to welcome everybody here today and um, it's over to you, uh, Professor Hughes, for your, um, I guess, words, which we're all interested in hearing about, um, yeah, the role, the, the future of the uh, National Climate Change and Ad Adaptation Work Plan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucinda, and, and thank you to Farmers for Climate Action for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so, um, and I'm going to I've obviously got it on the wrong. My apologies. Right, you've got a bit of time, Leslie. So yeah, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's come on to the wrong. I'll stop sharing. My apologies for the slight delay. Talk amongst yourselves, everyone. Talk amongst yourselves. It was all <laughs> working perfectly a minute ago. Um, never mind. I'll go back to that slide. <laughs> I had a, a much more attractive um, opening slide. I can attest to that. Okay, so everyone, um, this is basically what I'm going to talk about today. My opening slide just had some some pictures, as uh, Corey just described, of the apocalypse. So perhaps it's better if I don't show you that. Um, I want to cover three very broad topics very quickly today. I'm trying to speak for just 10 minutes and um, have time to take questions. I want to talk a little bit about what's happened so far to the climate what we might expect in the future and the impacts of that, and then what we have to do about it. Uh, so what's happened, of course, is that we now have nearly 50% more atmospheric CO2 in our skies than we did in pre-industrial times. Uh, we're now at a record atmospheric CO2 of 417 parts per million. I'm going to show you uh, a little animation now, uh, which will show you how the temperature has changed in every country in the world, including Australia, which is halfway along that first row since 1900. It'll bring us through to the present day and then we'll give you some projections for the future. Um, what all these little circles will mean is the size of the circle will represent the difference in temperature between that year and the average over the entire period. And the colour will indicate whether it's been a cooler than average year or a warmer than average year. And if you'll excuse the pun, it'll take a little while to warm up, but I think um, what is happening and has happened will be pretty obvious as we go through. So I'm hoping that this will work. Here we go. So that's where we were two years ago, and then we look to the future. So I realise it's a pretty grim picture. Just last year, 
2019 was the hottest year on record in Australia with average temperatures more than one and a half degrees above the long-term average. And indeed, this is just part of an ongoing trend because eight of the 10 warmest years on record have occurred in Australia since 2005. Our rainfall patterns, of course, are changing, as I'm sure you'll all be aware. Basically, the eastern half of Australia has been getting drier and also the western Australian coast uh, with the northwest getting wetter. And that's the, the trend since about 1970. Last year was also the driest year on record with rainfall 40% below average. Uh, and that is having huge impacts on regional Australia, especially. This was just in the news um, a short time ago with water having to be trucked into regional towns in southwest Western Australia because they have simply run out of water. If we look to the Murray-Darling Basin, which is uh, Australia's most important food bowl, um, the top graph shows the, the fluctuation in rainfall. Um, and the bottom graph shows uh, rainfall and temperature, the temperature in that purple line going inexorably upwards, the rainfall fluctuations and decline uh, in the green line. Uh, but in the past 20 years, there's been an 11% decline in the average cool season rainfall in the Murray-Darling. I'll talk a, a bit in the minute about what we might expect there in the future. As we saw last summer, um, it's becoming a much more flammable continent also. So these are the trends in uh, the forest fire danger index going back also to the 70s. This index is used by emergency services to assess fire danger on a particular day. Uh, and you can see those dark brownie orange colours are where that fire danger has increased the most. Um, we are seeing, in fact, fire conditions now so bad that they generate their own weather, such as is shown in this slide, a pyrocumulonimbus storm. And last summer we had 18 million hectares burnt in total, um, of which nearly two and a half million uh, hectares was farmland. Okay, so that's just very, very briefly what's been going on, what might we be expecting in the future? And the short answer is, I'm afraid, more of the same. More severe and more frequent extreme weather events, fires, storms, floods, droughts, all of those things have huge impacts. And if I return briefly to the Murray-Darling, this is uh, one projection from, a recent projection from the CSIRO that if we get to two degrees of global warming, that will translate into somewhere between a 20 and 40% reduction, further reduction from now in Murray-Darling Basin stream flow. So you're all here because you're all aware that farmers of course are at the very front line of climate, in, climate change impacts and I really can't think of a, a group in Australia, a professional group in Australia that is more at the front, front line than farmers and regional communities. So what do we collectively have to do? Well, you'll have all heard of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, in a nutshell, the Paris Climate Agreement aims for the global community to reduce emissions such that we do not go over two degrees of global warming. Uh, with an ambition, an aspiration to stay below 1.5 degrees. And I just want to tell you how we're tracking on this. Um, the way we look at how we're tracking is using a technique called the carbon budget, which is basically a translation of gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere into degrees of global warming. There are a lot of assumptions that the carbon budget makes, but as a tool for tracking where we're headed, um, it's, it's pretty good. Will we meet the 1.5 degree target? Well, at current emission rates, which are about 11 and a half gigatons of carbon uh, per, per year, uh, the carbon budget to get to 1.5 will be fully expended uh, two and a half years from now. So to meet this target, we would need a globally a five-fold increase in Paris pledges 
and their 100% successful implementation. So I think you can do the maths on whether we're going to meet 1.5. Can we meet the two degree target? Can we actually stay below two degrees? Well, at that same emission rate of 11.5 gigatons of carbon, the carbon budget for two degrees will be fully expended in nine and a half years from now, so before 2030. And to meet this target, we have to ramp up our pledges by at least threefold. So it's a very, very tough ask. So to stay below two degrees, we would have to halve our emissions by 2030. We would have to be at net zero by 2040. And we hear a lot about an aim for net zero by 2050. It's often lauded in business and in uh, other groups as being what we need to aim for. Unfortunately, the carbon budget is telling us that 2050 is too late. 2050 takes us well beyond two degrees and well on our way for three degrees or more. And it's a tough message, um, but there's really no point sugarcoating that. My second tough message is, of course, that what Australia does really matters. It matters what we do at home, but actually even more importantly, it matters what we do abroad. Um, we know that to stay below two degrees, at least 90% of global coal reserves must be left unburnt, unmined in the ground, and that includes Australian coal reserves. Australia is a huge contributor to the global climate problem. We're the largest exporter of coal uh, in total, accounting for about 29% of global trade, the second largest exporter of thermal coal, and the third largest exporter of fossil fuels overall, which includes oil and gas. That are relevant to the farming community, such as the use of water. So for example, in New South Wales and Queensland, where most of our coal is mined, coal mining and coal-fired power stations use uh, 383 billion litres of fresh water every year that would otherwise be used for other things. Clearly, farmers are worried about this. They're worried about impacts on groundwater. They're worried about the alienation of land to mining um, in fertile farming regions like the Liverpool Plains. So that is over and on top of uh, the climate impacts. But of course, we know that farmers have enormous potential to be part of the solution. Um, we know that renewable energy uh, infrastructure can coexist in regional areas on farming land. And we know that Australia has one of the best wind and solar renewable resources of anywhere in the world. Um, we also, uh, well, farm, the farming community also is a tremendously powerful voice for lobbying for change. And to that end, I want to show you this graph that was put together um, from government sources, but by the Australia Institute, which actually just shows you very, very starkly what the power of having a carbon price really is. So this dotted line shows Australia's um, carbon dioxide emissions. The orange bar shows what happened immediately upon the, the uh, imposition of a carbon price by the Gillard government. When the Abbott government removed the carbon price, you can see that emissions then uh, started to go up again. So the carbon price was a very, very strong and effective sig signal on emissions. Um, and basically our emissions have been more or less going up ever since including during the so-called Emissions Reduction Fund, um, which has cost billions of dollars of taxpayer money. So that is just one example of a, 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 a place where lobbying by a powerful group like farmers um, could possibly be effective. Um, but individual actions, of course, are fine. Um, and my final sort of message, I think, is that um, you know, many of those actions are encapsulated in the Regional Horizons report. Um, a coherent and integrated plan is a far more powerful tool than even the addition of all of the in 
individual actions by farmers across Australia. So my final message is to urge a focus on developing and implementing the National Climate Change and Agriculture Work Plan, uh, which was signed off by all the agricultural ministers last year. Um, but it, unless it's actually implemented, of course, it's just a piece of paper. So my final message would be to get behind and lobby for uh, the implementation of that plan. So I will leave it there. And hopefully I have left some time to take some questions. You Thanks, Corey. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. You, you've left uh, one whole minute extra time for okay. some questions. So, um, folks, please do start sending us um, your queries. We will give five minutes or so now and then uh, a bit more time at the end after the, the second talk. Um, I'll chip in. Uh, to, to kick things off. Thank you, Leslie, that, um, uh, you know, as much as I've, over the years I've worked on this, I've heard some of that before. Um, I think it, it pays to allow yourself to be floored by it and then to, to, to be afraid and to turn that fear into something that, that makes you an activist. And I use that in its very broadest sense that people, working in bureaucracies and companies are just uh, who are doing good things are just as important as people who take to the streets in my view um and and that's you know what can give us hope i think we create that hope hope isn't something that's given to you it has to be created uh so that's really important and i also want to note um while we're waiting for questions that um this came through uh today the university of sydney and several other unis around the world have pulled their resources to work out the sort of the key impacts uh, on the economy and emissions from the pandemic so far. And they worked out that it had knocked about 4 trillion US off consumption uh, and about 147 million people have lost their jobs. That's about 4% of the global workforce uh, and about two trillion in in salaries. Most of that's, uh, of course, in, in the states and China, with air and transport and everything being hit. But what is interesting, and if you think about it, not good, is that there's been the biggest ever drop in greenhouse gas emissions in history of 4.6 percent, about 2.5 gigatons. Uh, the last one was the global financial crisis, 2009, when it when it dipped. And what that tells us, uh, well, first, when, when the economy starts to recover, that will, that will tick up again very fast. That's what happened last time. But what it tells us is that in that 10 or 11 years, we have still not decoupled global prosperity, uh, economic prosperity, from uh, the pumping of pollution into the atmosphere. And that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that um, people don't lose jobs and at the same time emissions drop which is the whole raison d'etre for um, regional horizons. Folks, we're we getting some questions. Great, I'll shut up. Okay, so this one, I'm coming through. It, I think directly to us, someone's asking uh, who they could interview about the, the climate work plan, the agriculture work plan. Um, uh, I will get back to you on that uh, directly. Uh, or you can contact me directly and uh, we'll find people for you, either FCA and others. Um, to give a bit more brief to that, uh, that was actually a little bit of a win for us. Um, we had, um, we worked with the Victorian State Agriculture Minister, Charla Pulford, it was then, a couple of years ago, to table something uh, to that effect uh, at an agriculture minister's meeting in Brisbane a couple of years ago, and then uh, did our best to convince the various ministers, state and federal, to back it, and they did. Um, so we don't want to see that goodwill squandered. Okay, I'm not getting other questions. So, um, Corey, there are some questions in the chat box. I think people are maybe accessing. That. Oh, I see. Right. I beg your pardon, folks. They're not going through there. Give me two two shakes, and I'll find those. I do have some questions. Okay, tons of questions. Righto. Okay, let me get this one first. Um, okay. Someone suggesting that we formally link up catchments uh, like the Tamar where this person is and um, 
uh, I imagine just be connected and share exchange knowledge. And then I'm getting other questions coming through. Okay. Um, is anyone in the government's listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. Uh, this government has not been as listening as it could be. <clears throat> let's, let's face it, they've been pretty terrible on this. Uh, but I think things are starting to change. And, you know, we see in some members, even in, in the current federal government, uh, there is an active debate. And I think there is a change. Perhaps it's a generational change. Uh, and it, sometimes it doesn't look like there's change. Um, but if you've been in the game a long time, you can, you can see it. But, it, you know, it needs to translate into action. Uh, righto, what have, what have we got? So someone's asking about gas. And this would be to you, Leslie, I imagine. Does the, do, do we need to keep 90% of that in the, in the ground? Uh, does gas create as many emissions as coal? Um, yes, and thanks, Harry. Long time no see for that question. Um, yes, look, uh, the, the thing to remember about gas, of course, is it's also a fossil fuel. Um, gas does create, I don't have the figures in front of me as to how much uh, gas we need to leave unmined, but it's, it's a little bit less than 90%, but not much less. Um, what the Climate Council is, is really pushing is that while we need our current gas supply to transition to renewables, we do not need any more gas. We do not, we are very, very opposed to any new gas infrastructure. And it's particularly disappointing, and this comes back to another question, the other question about whether the government is listening. Unfortunately, the, the recently released technology roadmap um, and the committee in charge with delivering that is very heavy on people from the gas industry. Um, the government and that committee is talking about a gas-led recovery. Um, and if there is a whole lot of new gas infrastructure built, then that locks um, Australia into fossil fuel production of energy um, for many decades to come. So I think the, the clearest message that I would like to deliver is that we cannot afford any new gas infrastructure and we must transition out of gas as quickly as we can, just like we must transition out of coal. Gas is not an answer. It's not a benign substance. It produces CO2 emissions and it produces fugitive methane emissions. So uh, we've got to get out of gas just like we have to get out of coal. But thanks, Harry, for the question. Thanks, Leslie. Okay, I'm getting a few questions coming through thick and fast now. Thank you, folks. And I'm juggling between the chat box and Sligo. So uh, there are a few questions coming through about agriculture and also about who in government, um, the person's asking who, who they should call on to change. Um, uh, I would start with the Federal Agriculture Minister and the Opposition Spokesperson for Agriculture. That would be a good start. Um, I think both of those guys are actually not, not as recalcitrant as some. Um, but um, uh, I'll take that question on notice and actually uh, get FCA on that. Now, about agriculture, uh, Leslie, do you want to have a stab at that? And then I can speak on behalf of Farmers for Climate Action. What's your view? Yeah. Well, look, um, uh, agriculture obviously is, is part of the problem. I mean, there, there are significant emissions. I think it's round about somewhere between 15 and 20% of emissions in Australia per year are from agriculture. It depends on the year. Uh, during the drought, the emissions went down, which contributed to an overall drop in emissions. So, so you know, food production for all of us, and we all eat it, is, is part of the issue. Um, and just, just like everything else, there are, there are multiple, we, we need to um, bring in multiple solutions to that. So, um, you know, we were talking earlier before, before we all came online about what we need to do with uh, methane production in, in the beef industry. Uh, the Meat and Livestock Association are making some very good moves in that regard. You know, there is a lot of research going into feedstocks um, for um, uh, ruminant animals to reduce their emissions. Um, but one of the main things, of course, that we can do in regional land is to put carbon back into the land uh, by putting in, uh, restoring vegetation, increasing soil carbon, um, putting, putting um, habitat back for biodiversity, which has, if, if well done in a mosaic style in a landscape, can not only increase um, 
carbon stores take emissions out of the atmosphere, uh, but also have um, abundant benefits for both food production and biodiversity if done properly. So I, I think um, the agricultural sector has uh, enormous opportunities for both um, increasing its, its own prosperity and the prosperity of the country um, at the same time as reducing their emissions uh, right across the country. And I would think, of course, that Farmers for Climate Action is at the forefront of helping farmers uh, find that path. Thanks, Leslie. Yes, indeed, that is um, one of the reasons why we exist. And so there are a few questions about, about that and also about how how to engage farmers and about um, the, the doubt and scepticism and sometimes outright denial that one finds. Uh, still all too much in, in some rural and regional communities. Um, I'll have a quick stab and then I'll, I'll hand over. Um, uh, so there are actually a lot of ways to reduce emissions from agriculture. It's probably about, um, in this country at the moment, it's probably about 12 to 13% of the national uh, emissions profile and part of the reason for that is yes, uh, destocking from the herd, uh, sorry, from the drought, um, and, but also efficiency improvements. So uh, people are able to make more out of less. Um, worldwide, that, that approach is called sustainable intensification, uh, doing more with less. Um, there, uh, there are various technical ways to reduce emissions from livestock or rice or what have you, and, and the farming landscape. But they're also, uh, and they include things like vaccines and dietary change to the animals and uh, changing the breed um, and so on. But even simple measures like making sure that an animal isn't overheated. An animal that is heat stressed will produce more emissions. Um, more productive animals over their lifetime produce fewer emissions. Uh, we were just talking this morning, uh, Peter Holding and I, about uh, a Farmers for Ac uh, Climate Action member who has. Um, who inherited a, a sheep farm, and he hates sheep, um, but he runs a sheep farm. But he found a way to run less sheep, fewer sheep, and make more money. So it is actually possible through um, smart management, uh, which makes money, to uh, reduce the herd and be more productive. And then there are all sorts of solutions, as Leslie was alluding to on the land, uh, to, to uh, draw down and store carbon as well. Some of those... Uh, probably not as great as, as, as we sometimes think. Others come with risks, but they are important nonetheless for building resilience. That's one of the most important things that we think about soil and trees on farms and biodiversity restoration are very important there. I'm banging on and I'm not the one to be banging on. So uh, there are some other solutions coming through thick and fast. And we are finding, I will take this off, we are finding more and more farmers are receptive. In fact, Rabobank did a survey recently which showed that about two thirds of farmers now get that the climate is changing. Um, and about 20% of them are really scared that it's going to change so much in 10 years that it's going to have big economic impacts. Um, we want them to move from scared to active, and that's, and that's part of our job. Um, but times are a-changing. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce um, Russell, Russell Mehmet, um, uh, our... I was going to say Russell, our insurance salesman, but that's terrible. <laughs> our, our insurance expert. No, not and, quite. No, not quite. <laughs> Advisor. Advisor, thank you. <laughs> and um, and yeah. uh, I'm not going to steal your thunder, but I'm very keen to hear this one. Uh, there is a lot of movement in the insurance industry. And in fact, the insurance industry have been onto this for quite some time. Over to you. Right. Well, as you can see, um, Thanks very much, um, Corey. As you can see, I've been mucking around with trying to get uh, my presentation up. And is that the one that I submitted, is it, that, uh, with the invitation, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so apologies, everyone. I, it worked perfectly for Peter and me the other day where I was sharing screen, but this morning when we started to get in, it wasn't sharing. So we've gone back to the original one, which is pretty close to what uh, I had finalised anyway. So. So if we can jump in, and when we're asking the question about why in the insurance industry is taking climate change seriously, can I change slides or do you need to do that? I think you uh, can. From your end. Can yep, I? so I, yep. you yeah. need to do, yep, yeah. next slide. Yep, so 
and this is certainly an area that Leslie uh, has spent a lot of time on and explained so much better than I uh, can as an insurance person. But in the last, in the recent uh, World Economic Forum, uh, four out of the five world risks um, seen by major countries related to climate risk. Um, as uh, Leslie pointed out, there's constant uh, issues. The, the global uh, sea levels are uh, rising faster than ever. The increased intensity and impacts of uh, hurricanes in North America and of course in Australia we're seeing droughts and uh, rolling into uh, resultant bushfires. All dramatic reasons with, with natural catastrophes for the cause of what we're so concerned about and what insurers are now so concerned about um, through climate change. The major impacts will uh, be felt by industries and uh, climate risks such as insurance shouldn't be first, agriculture, insurance and, and certainly vital utilities and reduced uh, financials uh, there, reduced um, uh, outcomes from those industries have a knock-on effect to the economy of the rest of the world and significantly cause them to reduce. So next slide. Can I do that or you, yeah. Here's a very brief uh, snapshot on the past recent years, uh, last three years, major catastrophes around the world. Uh, little Australia down there, we got Cyclone Debbie over in Western Australia. So something went wrong with the illustration there. And, uh, but as you can see, major um, costs to the country uh, with, with the drought, recent droughts, 85 million. And just added on there, bushfires in Australia, the, the latest number is $100 billion. So again, significant, uh, significant cost as a result. Uh, next slide. So the thing about it is that these natural catastrophes are not new to insurance, to the insurance industry. We've been looking back since the 1980s um, about insurance industry has been looking at setting up greater reserves in that top point there greater reserves to be able to handle the ongoing frequency of natural catastrophes and uh, major, major losses. They're required to now have um, uh, significant solvency margins, which means they need to put aside enough reserves to cover the potential of major catastrophes. So the consumer is protected, um, whereas it wasn't quite the same in years gone by. These local insurance companies, direct insurers, the likes of QBE and Allianz and um, WFI and CGU, they're all take a small proportion, proportionately, of the overall cost and reinsurance, global reinsurance programs are set up um, to protect those local companies. And these are major, major capital uh, holders that carry a big proportion of the risks for uh, natural catastrophes. So their increased costs across the world have a flow on effect to the premiums that we pay in Australia. A bit like a bookmaker where uh, if he takes too much uh, in on a particular horse uh, and, and risks his uh, position uh, financially, he has to lay off his bets to other people. Well, that's the sort of thing that local insurers need to do so that they're protected against natural catastrophes. Climate risk, as we've said here, for the insurance industry is, is large and big today, but potentially and likely, as Leslie touched on, enormous tomorrow. With the worst case scenario, particularly for crop insurance, that uh, the, those sort of risks won't be insurable. Next slide. Yep. And how is the uh, how's Australian insurers, or how have Australian insurers responded? Well, not too well, but you've got to understand that with those natural disasters that, that they've experienced, the cost of those and the effects of global um, natural disasters have had a dramatic effect. Um, and in that next line, quite a bit different to many other countries in that they get subsidies from government for crop insurance we're mainly talking about here. Um, in particular in America, they get 60, around 65% subsidised for their crop insurance by the government, which allows them to build up the infrastructure and the uh, insurance uh, reserves needed to pay for their major catastrophes. But we don't have government subsidies in Australia, so it's a very, very tough industry, both for the, um, finance, the, the insurance company side of things 
who, who are there to make a profit for shareholders, uh, we, we've all got to understand. And at the same time, um, farmers finding premiums uh, just too difficult to manage. So last point, despite the boom and gloom, uh, global insurance, uh, the global insurance market is keen to underwrite Australian risks, particularly from a crop insurance point of view. And the thing here is that uh, with those reinsurers standing behind Australian insurers, the challenge is to make the premiums affordable for Australian farmers um, so that uh, uh, we can do it without government subsidies, which uh, we find is, is the current situation. So that's the challenge, but the insurance market wants to build up a market that's really underdeveloped, completely underdeveloped, underdeveloped crop insurance in Australia uh, and to promote that. So next slide. So just a very quick overview, mine is, mine is a very general talk, I've got to say, hopefully uh, be some help to people. But if we look at the, the types of insurance, farm pack insurance, um, uh, you know, cover a broad area, property, public liability, other risks, um, broad protection is picked up in a single pack. Most of you farmers would have this type of cover, um, but, few points Peter mentioned to, to uh, point out anything to be aware of and certainly in the recent fire losses and uh, there have been many people who haven't got what they expected as a payout fr arising from their loss but it has to be remembered that insurance policies uh, most insurance policies are set up on the basis of that you insure for the reinsure the replacement value and if you underinsure, then you've got to meet the under insurance proportion um, out of your own pocket. So for example, a million dollar property, you only insure for half a million dollars, a $200,000 loss occurs, you'll only receive 100,000. And that regrettably, to keep the premium cost down. And um, when you have a national catastrophe like fire we had, it has been a disaster for, um, for many farmers. But just a couple of other things to be aware of, non-farmer activities uh, are excluded in the public liability section of um, farm pack policies. For example, some insurers have recently moved away from uh, coal seam gas coverage, providing any public liability for the farm whatsoever if there is um, operational CSG uh, facilities, plants on their property. So something to be very wary of there needs to be arranged elsewhere. Uh, the one that's hidden under there uh, is flood insurance. Flood insurance is normally not provided and obviously, and, and certainly crop insurance. So then we just jump across to what we've spent a lot of our research on, that's crop insurance. Many of you would be aware that named peril insurance has been around for a long time, but the cover is pretty limited. Things like hail insurance for cotton is covered. Um, fire insurance for sugarcane can be covered. Uh, quite expensive, but, but available. And, uh, but the coverage is quite limited. Uh, the next slide. And moving into other crop insurance types, multi peril crop insurance, well, it, it's everyone, it's the Rolls Royce, as uh, my London colleague once called it, of uh, crop insurance, in that it provides most of the perils that a farmer would like to see covered. Unfortunately, it has been pretty expensive, very limited insurers providing, and with the droughts of the last 12 months, MPCI is virtually unobtainable any longer. So that, that leaves that out the door. So there's not too much left, unfortunately, for areas like with natural climate catastrophes that crop insurance can be provided for. One of them is index-based or parametric insurance. And this is an area we've been promoting, and I'll mention why in a moment, um, because it, it covers the actual event occurring, not the damage occurred. So uh, there's no need for assessors and adjusters to come through the property if the event occurs and the, and the bomb whoever the uh, um, weather reader states it is above us it meets the certain index then the claim is paid and it covers may it's intended for weather risks so drought excessive rainfall cyclones and even hail now is able to be picked up by index insurance and i'll just met, take the opportunity to mention the um, research groups for um, Agri agricultural climate work particularly that we've been involved in. The first one is the DAF, uh, Department of Agricultural and Fisheries in Queensland that we've been doing with University of Southern Queensland and 
Queensland Farmers Federation, looking into affordable, practical, and sustainable crop insurance, like they have in America, but without the, the subsidies that they talk about. And we think that the index-based approach is the way of making it more affordable. Um, Natural, National Farmers Federation, a project that started in June and finishes in October. Um, we've, been, we've looked after the mutuals and cooperatives uh, project there, which takes into account group buying power rather than in, in the cost of individual uh, uh, farmer premiums, grouping those together. And I'll give a very quick example in a moment of that. And finally, looking at environmental issues, NFF's project and CSIRO, we're looking at environmental risk initiatives for offsetting premiums with carbon credits, which again would be uh, music to uh, Leslie's ears, and also with CSIRO, the cover of uh, to cover cost of yield arising out of nitrogen uh, in the uh, barrier reef region is something we're looking at as well. Let's, uh, next slide. Here's a very quick example. I won't take long on how an index product works. So that you understand it, uh, if we're looking at Dolby, for example, at a farm in Dolby, um, in the period of January to February rainfall, where you vitally need the rain, if the average uh, millimetres of rain is 150 millimetres, but to survive, for your farm to survive, you need 50 millimetres. So you take out insurance just to keep the premium low as possible, just for that exposure of a disaster. And it's cost of production, Maybe be the full cost of yield or um, yield uh, return that you're looking at, but mainly back to um, the, the actual lower end. So in, you can see if we had a thousand dollars as the amount, the millimeter that you're below 50 millimeters uh, in each of those years, claims would have been paid in 2005, 2007, 2014, and obviously in recent years, but the illustration hasn't gone that far. So Payouts would have been made in the case of um, the one back in 2005, 27,000 was paid out using $1,000 per millimetre as the payout amount that you're below the 50 millimetres. That can be $10,000 or $100,000, whatever the farmer selects. So that's how a drought example can work. And the advantage is that it's whatever the amount that the farmer can afford to insure for, not for the full value of the farm. Uh, next slide. And here's another example very quickly of um, index insurance where we're looking at a cyclone example in Queen, in, for North Queensland, uh, Northern Australia. Um, if you're in the Mackay area and you wanted to be protected against cyclones, let's say exceeding through category three, um, you select an indemnification zone, let's say that's a 50 or 100 kilometer radius from your farm. If that cyclone passes through that, that indemnification zone, then the claim is paid immediately, whatever the um, indemnity you select might be, 100,000. So it doesn't relate to the damage that occurred, but rather to the cyclone occurring and the payout is made. And just to the next slide, rolling on a bit further from that, when I mentioned mutuals before, here's an example using cyclone of how a mutual could work. Keep in mind, we're talking cyclone here and, and sugarcane, but it could apply to um, drought or flood and any other commodity, because it's not the commodity that's important. So if we have the various regions along the coast where there are mill regions where cyclone could hit those locations, with cane growers as the group organisation, coming together and covering the member growers that want to participate, we get the advantage of group buying power of those members coming in. And instead of paying all their money to an insurance company in a mutual arrangement, part of the money goes into their own fund, a proper managed fund, and the remainder or some of the rest of the money would be used for administration and to buy insurance. So should a cyclone occur in that year, um, or more, one or more, and the million dollars that's in the members, the cane growers members fund is exhausted, the insurance company picks up all claims for the remainder of that season above that. It's a very crude example here, but that's the basics of it. So that, that limit up here could be 20, 50 million dollars, whatever's selected, and you only pay premium for that. 
So the major attraction is that in the years where there's been nice, no cyclones or the cyclone has been only minimal and small payouts made, there's profit or surplus to the mem belonging to the members that remain in that fund. They can look to build that fund up over years when there's no cyclones and pay less for insurance or um, take it forward and help pay for the premiums for the next year. Uh, next slide. And that's uh, getting close to the end of my presentation. I might just read the last uh, bits to you, if that's okay, um, because we see not only for our projects, but for the whole uh, future for uh, climate change, we're working in our areas and it's relevant for farming to firstly, the testing of farmers' willingness to pay for index insurances and researching the value of bringing, uh, on the end there, we've got mutuals, the agricultural sector. And secondly, continuing working with organisations like USQ, QFF, NFF and CSIRO uh, in developing insurance-based solutions. Uh, let's see the end of that. Uh, to offset the effects of climate change, including initiatives, I'll just read from my notes here, that involve government and corporations to help reduce to farmers and the reduce the cost to farmers and the environmental risk for all farmers. And finally, I can say from experience in discussions with our, our uh, colleagues in London and other areas globally, the international mar insurance market stands ready to partner the Austra with Australian farmers in managing climate change to risk in agriculture. And that's what we have to keep an open mind that uh, if we can participate in some of these projects, in pilot projects particularly, they will uh, reap rewards and um, give us something that it's uh, manageable from an insurance point of view for the future. And that pretty ra much wraps up. Happy to answer any questions anyone might have. I'll do my best. Good on you, Russell. Thank you so much. <coughs> Because I banged on a bit um, in between, uh, we're a little bit short of time, but um, sure. uh, if, if people want to keep going uh, five or so minutes uh, over time, we'll be around. And um, after the formal close, uh, if people want to keep want to keep talking for about 10 minutes, um, we'll, we'll do that too. So thank you very much, Russell. That's actually really interesting for the, for the farmers in the room, uh, most especially so. And we've also already got questions and comments coming through. Uh, this one from our very own Steve Hobbs, um, asking, well, saying, being able to identify and adapt your business to your greatest risks would be more sustainable than paying people money to continue with their existing behaviours and practices. So the problem is the insurance is, with yep. insurance, the size of the pool, the lower the number of yep. participants, the higher the premiums and the lower the payout. Do you want yes. to comment? Yes. Yes, a very good point. And that was an additional slide that I never got to that I had in my pack. <laughs> it wasn't in there. Because <laughs> I thought that was a very good question. And it really is, it talks about that one slide, and it was a study done by University of Southern Queensland on the importance to blend risk management, on-farm risk management with risk transfer uh, or insurance. And this example looks at, in the next 10 years, around 2.6 billion in risk that's involved. The half of that is in relation to farmers taking the necessary steps with risk management and in, in managing risks that they can handle. The other half is the natural catastrophes that, uh, is, that can be insurable. So yes, it definitely is a combination of both the farmer involvement with his risk management as well as the potential to uh, make insurance uh, be available for cover as required. Thanks very much, Russell. Yeah. Um, there's another one coming through here. Uh, this is from Helen. She says, having been part of the lobbying of insurers and reinsurers over Adani, there's a mixed view of where self-interest currently is in the industries. Uh, Marshall McLennan explicitly That's say money to be made in coal for now and that that money is attractive. So will insurance on balance help drive behaviour towards mitigation or simply be an opportunist player? Question I can't answer, I guess, because it uh, it just really depends on the, the you know the, the higher end of the insurance company mm. side of things, and we just just haven't got 
brokers and insurers are different in their answers to that question. Mm -hmm. And so it is um, regrettably, Helen, I can't give you a direct answer. Uh, uh, you know, we may know one company's point of view, but it may differ to another. So uh, very much a, um, I can use the word varies, yeah. uh, situation in the, in the current market, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's the same with business too. There's clear, uh, and other parts of business rather, there are clear signs of, of progress and acknowledgement. Yep. And, and uh, the need to steer things. To, I mean, the, uh, the Reserve Bank has um, has said that unless we change direction soon, um, mm -hmm. that uh, the damages will become irreversible. And Insurance Australia Group last year said that um, you know if we continue our present path, um, you know, half the world will be uninsurable. Now I'm getting a few others, um, and I will persist if people want me to, and if everybody's happy for a few more minutes. Uh, someone says, unless the government can contribute, multi peril crop insurance isn't sustainable. Um, and then I'll quickly... Fair point. The other, yeah. And the other point. one is, yep. uh, question, are there plenty of consultants to help farmers understand the intricate details of, of the new models of insurance? Mm, pro probably not. Yeah. Probably not. And that's one of the big education situations. Yeah. There's got to be a way. And that's part of NFF. It'll be part of our recommendation to yeah. the government, to NFF to government. They must find a way uh, of spreading that education so they can see those sort of values uh, that can be brought and decide whether they're there for them or they're not. Um, yeah. But at the moment, no, there isn't sufficient um, uh, advisors out there to farmers. Correct. That's certainly our sense too. Um, and in fact, we are of the view that uh, the, the, the farm advisors, be they bankers, insurers, uh, input suppliers, fertilizer companies, whatever, um, yeah. there's a task to be done there from industries themselves, but also from government, perhaps under the new future drought fund, which has some yeah. very good elements to it. Perhaps yes. in that, some elements to to bring them up to speed on everything from you know carbon plantations and and so on to to uh, climate risk management. We yeah. better plow on. There's a few more coming through. Um, if people don't mind, uh, Lauren Ricketts says climate councils climate council um, presented a useful analysis of the impacts of climate change on the whole of Australia's food system. Are these impacts on other parts of the food system also at risk of becoming uninsurable? So, for instance, food processes. Mm. Um, and what flow on effects would there be on ag? Mm. Not, not as great, but as you could imagine, um, they'll be affected. If you take, mm. again, going back to the sugar mills in uh, North Queensland, if, if, natural, if cyclones strike there, they totally rely on mm. the supply of their growers mm. and uh, that will have the flow on effect to them. Mm. They don't have insurance for that sort of thing. Um, so they have their own business interruption cover if they have a, a loss themselves. But if there's a natural catastrophe uh, elsewhere, there's not necessarily the cover for them. Mm. So uh, definitely that sort of exposure does flow on the mm. supply of uh, agriculture to processes is definitely an issue. Mm. And we've seen that in other supply chains as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, years ago, there was big floods in, ba in Bangkok and uh, Bangkok actually produces... Yeah the bulk of the world's hard drives. And there was a hard drive shortage, a computer shortage in the UK for a bit, and it prompted the British government to get more proactive uh, in, um, yeah. in lobbying governments to do something about climate change. Uh, yeah. A few yeah. more. Uh, how is, I don't understand this one. How is American government support funded through state or federal taxation or other levies? Mm. Yeah, not, not yeah. sure yeah. the answer on that one. Yeah. No, nor me. I mean, the US, spends an awful lot of money on subsidies yeah and they can kind of turn them this way or that um and there's a few other things oh there's a question here about uh i think this is one to a general audience um are there any moves uh to introduce electric tractors and or promote electric cars um do you have a view on that russell or uh, or not aware uh, of it that'd be more of the from a farmer point of view, I think. Yeah. I, I'm not aware, certainly not from the insurance industry. Yeah. My, my sense is, um, talking to people, is that it's tricky um, for a number of reasons mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, we know that electric vehicles and low emissions vehicles are coming. They're already here, some of them. Um, and for long haul, for trucks, 
um, uh, more and more of those uh, either switching to gas or hybrid or, or electric. And in fact, Kenworth, along with Tesla, have started to uh, um, build electric trucks and they work perfectly well. Um, so they will come. Um, but on farm, yeah. it's a bit tricky. So uh, a tractor's got to operate, you know, 12 hours a day. Um, so at the moment, the, you know, it will be done eventually, but um, it'll come a little bit slower. But people like John Deere and others, well, when I say people, corporations, um, uh, are investing in these things. Um, there are, of course, efforts to promote biodiesel uh, and, and uh, biofuels, which can be, uh, can be good at a local level, certainly. Um, and, uh, uh, but what we, I think what we will see is more producers, particularly in the food bowls, uh, the, the food and tourism bowls around cities. So I'm in the Yarra Valley. And uh, already at the caravan park across the road, there's a charging station. And, you know, this is one more opportunity, I think, for farmers in those areas to host charging stations uh, and other infrastructure for vehicles and to, you know, cross promote that with tourism, so wine tourism or, or um, orchards and so on and so forth. So there are opportunities there. Yeah. And someone, Charlie Prell says, New South Wales DPI are running a series of webinars called Beyond Diesel. The first one was last week. Looking forward to the next one. Uh, and there's a Swiss tractor manufacturer, apparently, who's working on electric vehicles. So it, it's beginning to happen. Um, I think we probably better move along. Uh, okay, this one I think is, is pertinent, um, especially. Will the new insurance model support diverse incomes like carbon farming and I suppose also energy on farms and those sorts of things? <clears throat> What's your view, Russell? Mm, it's a good question. And it's something that we're delving into with our NFF project at the moment. In fact, we've got some, it's been around for a while, the whole concept mm. of, um, you know, carbon trading, uh, trading off the cost of premiums for if um, the mm. farmer is prepared to look at his carbon uh, footprint, those sort of things and take the mm. necessary measures, but nothing has been formalised yet. And we're mm. trying to put a pretty strong proposition in the current NFF project, which as I say, goes in in October, mm. uh, that would support why there isn't, uh, why we shouldn't look at that being available. So mm. uh, not at the moment, but has potential. Mm. And of course, there's a, there's a very strong move now uh, to digital agriculture, um, which is already uh, bearing fruit in terms of less water wastage and uh, um, uh, lower livestock emissions in some cases, because people are better able to manage things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, yep. and with that, and I know NFF are very keen on that. So you know, there's there is this new tech move, and even um, you know, robot robot tractors, which are already available. But farmers like to ride in their tractors. <laughs> they they like it. They like being out there. That's why they farm. So there is a human element to this. <laughs> yeah. Um, we probably right. better get better get moving because we did promise to to end at one o'clock and we're about five overdue so uh if people don't mind i i will just um let you a little bit firstly look thank you everyone the questions were wonderful really very good questions actually a nice spread um and i hope that you got uh, as much out of those talks as i did thank you very much leslie and russell thank you that's a, a really uh, good double act, uh, double act. I really appreciate it. Um, we know that you're very, you're both of you are very, very busy, but everyone here appreciates it. And we will make this video available and we'll make more materials available. And I've already sent you some links to answer some of those questions about client solutions on farm. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, Fiona, uh, our communications manager will. Um, let me just, a um, couple of points. One is that I mentioned the Future Drought Fund, which the government's just uh, announced, and that comes after a lot of work, a lot of submissions uh, from farmers as well as others in regional Australia catchment groups and others. Um, and we were one of those who made a very uh, detailed submission. Um, look, we think it's got potential. Uh, nothing's perfect, and, um, and there's a lot more that could be done. Uh, but it's something like five billion over the next 10 years, or it's supposed to be that. Uh, the, 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 the two key things we give us some hope about this, um, one is that, well, three really, one is there's a spread of funding uh, and a lot of it's for on-farm risk management and so on. And it represents really 
um, a change. If anyone, anyone who knows drought policy in this country um, knows that there's been about 10 inquiries and every one of them's ended up in the same position, back to uh, um, a very understandable position because people are in pain, they're suffering uh, and they need help. Um, but we know that the climate is changing and I think even the federal agriculture minister knows that. I think he twigs to that. He doesn't say it as much because he's got to play to his audience, but um, he, um, you know, I think he gets it. Uh, and so this is a real change from that ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to something about, you know, it's got risk management and preparation and resilience built into it. Uh, the proof will be in, in the eating of the pudding, of course. But um, so that gives us a little bit of confidence. And the other thing is that the five members of the consultative committee, um, some of whom I know quite well, um, and they are, all of them are very intelligent people, very thoughtful people, they get it. So they're no fools. So, you know, and he's no fool. Whatever you think of the Federal Agriculture Minister, he's not silly. So, you know, that, that gives me a little hint. That gives us some confidence. Um, but we're going to make sure that it, uh, it does the right thing. Uh, and the really important thing, of course, is that it's all very well um, building resilience. But, you know, if we hit two degrees or more, uh, all those good efforts could be undone. And that's the message we're sending to the federal government and to all governments. You've got to, do, you've got to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. So anyway, the next next step is there'll be uh, part two will come up in, oh, I don't have a date, but soon, stay tuned. Uh, and in that will be uh, uh, focus on, on renewable energy from Karen Stark, who's a renewable energy consultant um, uh, and uh, a farmer. Uh, she's on irrigation property in New South Wales and a very smart person, very switched on, if you'll pardon the pun, about renewables, about renewables on farm. And there's some really interesting stuff going on. When any, anyone ever tells you that, you know, oh, it'll be wall to wall solar panels and what have you. No, no, they're really good um, models where you can actually use solar panels, for instance, on a paddock to improve soil condition, improve pasture productivity and put some sheep in there. Um, and these things, as Charlie Prell, um, uh, one of our spokespeople will tell you, um, himself a, an energy farmer, wind farmer, he'll tell you that it's, it's given him hope and many other farmers hope, and particularly where there are community-based models. That's something we really like. And the other talk will be uh, by Doug McNichol from Meat and Livestock Australia, who about a year ago, two years ago, announced an, at least an aspirational target of carbon neutrality by 2030. And that was a recognition, um, both that they needed to change um, because the market was telling them that they needed to change. Uh, and, you know, Australia being the second biggest beef exporter, uh, you know, its reputation um, it means a lot to the industry and the people in it. So they do need to do something about it. So MLA is working on that. And it'd be really good to hear from Doug about climate smart agriculture, ways, means, and, and what's in it for farmers. So we really hope, uh, we really hope to see you and many more next time. Uh, there's so many questions still coming through. <laughs> I'm really sorry I can't get to them all. Um, so without further ado, um, um, oh, I did want to say one more thing. So um, anybody there, and a few people have piped up, uh, whether, you're, um, uh, whether you're just a, an ordinary member of the community or you work in government or business, um, please do reach out to us. We're really keen to hear from you. Um, we think that those connections are very important. They're certainly important in rural Australia. It's something farmers really value. Um, you know, when we ask them, what do you think of us? They might say, you know, we've never really heard of you, but at least you're here talking to me, um, which is, you know, a start. And that's, uh, we can't do that in a pandemic, of course, but when it's over, it's those community connections, they're the things that build resilience. They, they are the soft infrastructure, if you like, of the country. So I'm going to shut up now and let everyone go. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you next time. Thank you.